Okay. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the ENS President and the Congress President for the opportunity to present the results of the Rescue ICP study. This is the first presentation of this trial of decompressive craniectomy for traumatic intracranial hypertension. The content of the talk and the manuscript have been published uh, last night and is available on the New England Journal of Medicine website, nejm.org. In terms of decompressive craniectomy for traumatic brain injury, this can be a primary decompression for a mass lesion, leaving the bone flap out after evacuation of an acute subdural hematoma. That is the topic of an ongoing randomized study rescue ASDH. In terms of secondary decompressive craniectomy for the management of raised intracranial pressure, there are two randomized studies. The first was the DECRA study, randomized 155 patients with severe diffuse TBI within 72 hours of injury with an ICP threshold of 20. And DECRA showed patients randomized to medical or surgical treatment had a mortality that was similar but an increased rate of disability and unfavorable outcome in the surgical patients. So I will now present the results of the rescue ICP study. The hypothesis for this study was that decompressive craniectomy can improve outcomes as a last tier therapy for a fractury post-traumatic intracranial hypertension. This was a prospective randomized study targeting patients on an intensive care unit with traumatic brain injury ventilated with refractory intracranial pressure which did not respond to conventional medical treatment. Patients were randomized into advanced medical management including the use of barbiturates in one arm versus surgical management, a decompressive craniectomy in the other. So we included patients with TBI requiring ICP monitoring with an ICP threshold of more than 25 millimeters of mercury for one to 12 hours and an age range of 10 to 65 years. Patients may have had a craniotomy for a mass lesion prior to randomization, but not a primary decompressive craniectomy. And we excluded patients with these exclusion criteria uh, consistent with a poor prognosis. So this is the trial protocol. This was designed across three stages. Stage one, initial treatment measures, so ventilation and sedation with monitoring, including ICP monitoring. If the intracranial pressure was greater than 25 millimeters of mercury, patients moved to stage two, where there were optional treatments to try and control the ICP. These included ventriculostomy, the use of inotropes, osmotic agents, and hypothermia. But despite that, if intracranial pressure remained high, more than 25 millimeters of mercury for a period of one to 12 hours, then patients were randomized into a surgical group, decompressive craniectomy, continuing stage one and stage two treatments, or a medical group, stage one and stage two treatments, but in the medical group, barbiturates uh, were permitted. The primary endpoint for this study was the six-month extended Glasgow outcome score. A number of secondary endpoints, including 12-month Glasgow outcome, 24 months, and the number of other endpoints, including quality of life and a health economic analysis. The extended Glasgow outcome scale is an eight-point scale, which ranges from death to upper good recovery and in between varying degrees of disability, including vegetative state, unable to obey commands, lower severe disability, dependent on others for care, and upper severe disability, independent at home. The sample size was 400 patients to be randomized based on a 15% difference in outcome at the level of upper severe disability or better. This was the powering the statistical analysis plan for this rescue ICP trial was designed prior to unblinding of the results and was published in the British Journal of Neurosurgery. So 2,008 patients were assessed for eligibility, of whom 1,599 were excluded, the majority because their ICP was not raised. So we randomized 408 patients. This was in 52 neurosurgical centers across 20 countries worldwide. 
Allocated to decompressive craniectomy was 206 patients. Allocated to continued medical treatment with the added option of using our barbiturate infusion, 202 patients. These are the baseline characteristics. So the median age in the surgical group was 32 years and the medical group 34.8 years. Predominantly male, 80% equivalent in both arms. Hypotension, hypoxemia, similar across both arms. And in fact, there were no significant between group differences in the baseline characteristics, except for a history of drug or alcohol abuse, which was higher in the uh, medical group. Approximately 80% of the patients had diffuse injury and 20% had a mass lesion, but this was a balance between the two groups on the uh, CT imaging. In terms of treatment or interventions, 12.9% of the surgical group had an initial craniotomy for evacuation of a hematoma, 15.3% of the medical group. The standard therapy to control ICP was equivalent between the two groups. In terms of decompressive craniectomy, in the surgical group, 92.6% underwent a decompression. This was bifrontal in 63% of the patients and unilateral in 37% of the patients. 9.4% of the surgical patients following their craniectomy required barbiturates to control ICP postoperatively. Of importance in the medical group is that 37% of patients in the medical arm actually proceeded to a decompressive craniectomy following their treatment with barbiturates. And this was actually occurred in 87.2% of the patients in the medical group had barbiturates. So there was a high proportion of medical patients who actually did undergo craniectomy. In terms of the results, so the six month Glasgow outcome, this was highly significantly different between the surgical group and the medical group. What did it show? Well, the rate of death in the surgical group was 26.9%, in the medical group, 48.9%. Vegetative state, 8.5 versus 2.1. Lower severe disability, 21.9 versus 14.4. Upper severe disability was 15.4 versus 8.0. Lower moderate disability, 10% in both groups. Upper moderate disability, 13.4 versus 9.6. Lower good recovery, 2.5 versus 3.2. And upper good recovery was 1.5 versus 3.7. If we now present these results on this bar chart, this shows graphically the differences between the surgical and the medical group. In summary, there was a significantly reduced mortality in the surgical group compared to the medical group. There was an increased rate of vegetative state, lower severe disability and upper severe disability, and a similar rate of moderate disability and good recovery. In terms of the pre-specified sensitivity analysis with the six month Glasgow outcome collapsed into these three categories, this again shows the big difference in mortality, approximately a quarter of the patients in the surgical group and half in the medical group. Upper severe disability or better was 42.8% in the surgical group and 34.6% in the medical group, p-value shown here. What about the 12-month Glasgow outcome? So again, this remained highly statistically significant. Mortality in the surgical group was 30.4%, in the medical group, 52%. Vegetative state, 6.2 versus 1.7. Lower severe disability, 18 versus 14, upper severe 13.4 versus 3.9, lower moderate was 10.3 versus 7.8, upper moderate 11.9 versus 12.3, lower good 7.2 versus 3.9, and upper good 2.6 versus 4.5. And shown graphically again on the bra chart, again showing the the difference in mortality and the spread of the outcome in the uh, survivors. If we again for the pre-specified sensitivity analysis collapse this into three categories, in the surgical group mortality 30.4%, 40.3% in 
45.4% of patients in the surgical group were upper severe disability or better. In the medical group, mortality 52% and 32.4% of patients in the medical group were upper severe disability or better. And this is uh, the p-value at 0 0.01. How can we try and interpret this data? Well, if you look at the outcome of the extra survivors with craniectomy at six months, for every 100 patients treated with surgical versus medical intent, there were 22 more survivors. Of these 22 more survivors, six were at a vegetative state, eight were lower severe disability, and eight were upper severe disability or better. Remember, this was uh, predefined. At 12 months, this shows uh, some improvement. So for every 100 patients treated with craniectomy versus medical intent, there were 22 more survivors of whom five were in a vegetative state, so we need to be very conscious of this. Four were lower severe disability, and 13 or 59% were upper severe disability or, or better. What about some of the other data? So this is the intracranial pressure data, and it is clear, I think we've always felt that craniectomy is good at controlling ICP compared to the advanced medical management. And the median duration of intracranial pressure greater than 25 millimeters of mercury after randomization was five hours in the surgical group and 17 hours in the medical group. And this was highly statistically significant. In terms of reporting of complications and adverse events, this was higher in the surgical group. Numbers of patients with at least one reported complication or adverse event was 33 versus 18 in the medical group. And there were a number of complications that were reported consistent with the severe nature of the injuries of these patients and, and some of the complications from treatment. So uh, to conclude, this study, Rescue ICP, provides class one evidence for using last year decompressive craniectomy as a life-saving intervention for a fractury raised intracranial pressure following traumatic brain injury. The primary outcome at six months, craniectomy was associated with lower mortality, a higher rate of vegetative state, lower severe disability dependence, and upper severe disability consistent with independence at home, and similar rates of moderate disability and good recovery. On the pre-specified sensitivity analysis at upper severe disability or better, six months was 42.8% with surgery, 34.6% with medical treatment. At 12 months, 45.4% with surgery versus 32.4% with medical treatment. We hope that these results will provide important information to guide clinicians and families in terms of decision-making for this operation. I'd like to finish by just briefly mentioning the Rescue Acute Subdural Study. So this is a randomized study of primary decompressive craniectomy so patients with an acute subdural hematoma seen on CT scan who are going for surgery to have it evacuated are randomized between having the bone flap placed back or the bone flap left out as a primary decompressive craniectomy. This study has now randomized 120 patients. This is the website for the study and we would welcome more centers to, to join this study. I'd like to acknowledge the patients and families who participated in this trial. I'd also like to thank the Rescue ICP investigators, the collaborating clinicians and the research staff. I'd like to particularly thank Angelos Kolias, who's been very helpful in terms of finalizing the data and, and, and getting the, the paper disseminated. Members of the trial steering committee chaired by Tony Bell and members of the data monitoring and ethics committee, the independent chair, Mr. Donald Shaw. I'd also like to thank the funding agencies. Uh, they were very patient during this study. This study took, took several years to complete. And I'd like to particularly thank the support of the MRC UK and the National Institute for Health Research in terms of funding and, and assisting the funding of these study across a number of years. And a number of other organizations, the Academy of Medical Sciences, Health Foundation, the Royal College of Surgeons, the Evelyn Trust, and the support we had from the European Brain Injury Consortium. And finally, Centre TBI, who are 
one of our partners in the Rescue Acute Subdural Study that is embedded within Centre TBI. In terms of contact, I'm not sure if I have time for questions, but if there's any correspondence, then I'd be very happy to receive emails. This is the website for Rescue Acute Subdural Hematoma. And thank you again for allowing me to present this study, and thank you for your attention. Thank you.